Hey, Mr. P here. What's up guys, it's Mr. Schmitz. And in this video we're going to talk about chemical reactions and enzymes and how all of the enzymatic reactions and biologic reactions play into our metabolism overall. In the last video we talked specifically about nucleic acids and nucleotides. And now we're gonna finish out our understanding of biological molecules by talking about enzymes and how they interact with biological reactions. To start with, we can look at this chemical reaction, and just as a reminder, a chemical reaction is any process that changes or transforms a set of compounds into another set. So in a chemical reaction, we have reactants and products. Usually, we have the reactants on the left side and the products on the right side. As you can see here, your reactants for cellular respiration would be glucose, which we learned about in our carbohydrates discussion, and oxygen and those work to create our products, which in this case would be carbon dioxide, water, and energy, or ATP. And this is a chemical reaction we don't really need to know in depth at this point. We're gonna do uh, cellular respiration or learn about cellular respiration in a lot more detail in a later unit, but for now we wanted to kind of highlight the chemical reaction by at least showing you a cellular respiration equation. Chemical reactions occur in all living things and all living things therefore have a, what we call a metabolism. And when we're talking about metabolism, it's important to highlight what makes up your metabolism and so metabolism is all anabolic plus catabolic reactions. And the only reason I bring these up is anabolic reaction and catabolic reactions require the use of an enzyme, which is what we're gonna get into in this particular video. Anabolic reactions would be reactions that build up smaller reactants into larger products, and catabolic reactions would be the opposite if we were to switch this arrow and break larger compounds into smaller or break down what we typically think of digestion would be more of the catabolic reactions. But when we talk about catabolic and anabolic, those make up all biologic reactions, which would be metabolism. Let's get into enzymes. So how do enzymes work? Enzymes work to speed up or aid chemical reactions. They do this by lowering what we call the activation energy. So in any chemical reaction, there's always what we call substrates and products. We, in the last slide, called them reactants. So we're still keeping that terminology the same. We have reactants, we have products. There is a certain amount of energy that is available to a reaction, both in the substrate and in the products. And you'll notice that in this particular graph, the energy available within the substrates or the reactants is higher than the energy that we get out of the equation within the products. There is, like he said, a certain amount of energy that is required in order to initiate a reaction. So from this dotted line to the top of this peak, that is the amount of energy that is required to take the substrate and turn them into the products. That energy can be substantially decreased with the use of an enzyme. You'll notice that in this particular graph, there is about half as much activation energy utilizing an enzyme as there was without. So you could very easily say that the enzyme helps the process along because it makes it require less energy. So one of the first benefits uh, that we use enzymes for that enzymes allow us is that they reduce the activation energy, which we can see in this graph. Two, because they're reducing the activation energy, it takes less time for the reaction to take place. So it's actually going to reduce the time we can also say speed up the chemical reaction by reducing activation energy. Yeah, that would probably be your two biggest takeaways about enzymes and enzymatic activity is that it's going to reduce activation energy and speed up the reaction as a result. And it is important to note that a lot of people think that biological reactions would not occur in the absence of an enzyme, but they do occur in the absence of enzymes. These biological reactions or chemical reactions will occur, however, enzymes employed reduce the activation energy and therefore reduce the time. And so by reducing the energy expenditure and reducing time, it makes our biological reactions a lot more efficient, which helps us out. Right. So one of the things we also need to talk about is the specific anatomy of the enzyme. So we have what we call the enzyme. It's a globular quaternary protein. Uh, in one of the last videos, we talked about protein structure. So this would be our fourth level of protein folding. This is a globular protein, so it is more functional in nature, not structural. It has a particular spot that a substrate fits into. We call that the active site. 
and then we have a substrate which is specific to the active site. Notice the shape is the same, and so the substrate is what is going to be reacted on by the enzyme when the substrate binds to the active site and therefore fills the gap within the enzyme, it creates what we call the enzyme substrate complex. So this is one of the reasons why protein shape is so important from what we talked about in our protein lecture. These enzymes have a specific shape that has to be matched specifically with the shape of the substrate, almost like a lock and a key. Mm -hmm. Enzyme substrate complex. Here's a little bit more detail on, on the same thing that we were just mentioning, showing you a substrate in this example. This substrate would be being broken apart by the enzyme, and so the substrate is a larger molecule. Yeah, so if we talk about going from larger to smaller, notice this is a two-ring structure. Uh, if we think about the carbohydrate, this could be lactose, which is a disaccharide. One of these rings being a specific galactase and one being a glucose and if you had those linked together it would be a disaccharide which in this case may be a lactose. If it is split in half then it reduces the products into individual monosaccharides and so like we said it could be a glucose and a galactose. Like I said in the previous slide this would be an example of a catabolic reaction where we're taking larger substrate and breaking it down into smaller products. This would be a really good thing for you to be able to illustrate and yeah. discuss. Yep. So if we go through it a little bit more, if this is a lactose, then this would be a lactase. Why do you know this is an enzyme? Because of the last three letters. This, the suffix is ace. If you see ace on a word in biology, it usually means it's an enzyme. Perfect. So we have a lactose, that is the sugar. It is a disaccharide. It's going to bond to our lactase, which is an enzyme utilizing the specifically shaped active site once it creates the enzyme substrate complex, which is the enzyme and substrate bound. The enzyme will initiate or catalyze the biological reaction of breaking down lactose into the two in, uh, individual products and they will be released. It is important also to note that these enzymes, while they are catalyzing the reactions, can be reused over and over. It's not just a one-time expenditure. So like we said, reactants in the enzyme are catalyzed within the reaction. The enzyme substrate complex is formed when the substrate binds to the active site and then molecules created during an enzyme catalyzed reaction are the products. And like we said before, we use the term enzyme substrate specificity, which is highlighting the enzyme's ability to be structured in a way that allows it to catalyze a specifically shaped substrate. So we're gonna finish up today's lecture by looking at the factors that affect enzyme activity. So, so far we've talked about the enzyme substrate complex and how the substrate fits perfectly into the active site of the enzyme. So to wrap up, we're gonna talk about what are some ways that that enzyme activity and that enzyme substrate complex can be affected. On the graph here, you can see there are three different factors that affect enzyme activity, pH, temperature, and substrate concentration. So to just look at each one of these individually, you can see at the pH graph, there is a rate of reaction and pH as pH increases and decreases. The big thing to understand with pH, guys, is that there's an optimum pH for every enzyme. And that would be where your peak of the graph is at. It's gonna function best under one certain pH and as you move either higher or lower than that, away from that optimum pH, your activity is going to decrease. And it's important to note too that enzymes have different optimum pHs. So enzymes that work best in your stomach are going to have an optimum pH of two, while an enzyme that works best in your blood is gonna maybe have a pH of eight. Right, and so moving on to the temperature graph, you can see as temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases, generally speaking, but we see sort of an interesting phenomenon happen in the temperature graph where you see this drop off occur. So we have still an optimum temperature at the peak of your graph, but after that, you see a, a, a rapid decrease in the rate of the reaction. So what's going on with this is what's called denaturation or denaturation. Um, which is the breakdown or the changing of the shape of the protein. So we talked about the structure of proteins and we talked about how this is a quaternary protein um, with this intricate folding. When a protein or an enzyme gets too hot, that will break some of those bonds and actually change the shape of the protein, which is an irreversible occurrence, which would cause the loss of the function of that enzyme. 
Right. And so when you look at rate of reaction, obviously optimum temperature, or optimum pH is going to provide the enzyme the, the most efficient rate of reaction and the highest rate of reaction. And like you said, it falls really quickly or falls more quickly on the higher end of optimum versus the lower end. And it's just, like you said, the breaking of the bonds that pulls that quaternary protein structure apart and it no longer functions the way it does, which is why it goes or crashes to zero. Right. On those lower temperatures, it's basically just slowing it down and not happening as quickly. Yep. The denaturation isn't occurring until you hit that high point on the temperature. Correct. Which is why having heat stroke or hyperthermia, which is uh, an elevated or an increase in body temp, is so detrimental to your health. Right. The last one there is substrate concentration. So in the substrate complex, remember that the substrate is what's being broken down. So having more of a substrate, as shown in this graph, is going to increase the rate of reaction. And that only occurs to a certain extent. So in this graph, again, you can see how that levels off at a certain point. Eventually, you hit a point with the substrate where there's so much substrate that there's not enough enzymes to break down all of the substrates. And that's why that graph levels off. But you can see that very rapidly as the substrate concentration increases, so does the rate of reaction. Yeah, and I like to think of this within the context of an analogy. If you have 10 people working for you, you could continue, and, and we're obviously talking about running a business, but if you have 10 employees or 10 people working for you, you can continue to add work to their plate and work to their workload and continue to add business and business, but there is a certain point in which 10 employees can work at its maximum efficiency or its maximum productivity. If you were to increase your employee count and increase work, then you would obviously increase productivity of the company or the business. That's how businesses grow. If you decreased the number of employees, then obviously this would decrease as well. So the peak on a graph like this is directly correlated to the number of enzymes present, no matter how much work or how much substrate is available to those enzymes. So from this, you should definitely know and be able to talk about things that affect the rate of enzyme activity, as well as talking about how enzyme activity functions in our bodies. Yeah, and enzymes are incredibly important, and this is not the last time you will talk about or hear about the impact of enzymes in biology, as that is one of the most fundamental concepts throughout the class. Thanks so much for being here. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you.